Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today I'd like to continue our discussion on proportional integral derivative or PID controllers. So in our previous video we introduced the concept of PID controllers and laid down some of the theoretical mathematics and concepts behind a PID controller. We also discussed how these were some of the most popular and powerful controllers in use today. Now despite their popularity and versatility it isn't all rainbows and unicorns with PID controllers all the time. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about some practical implementation issues you should be aware of if you want to make effective use of PID controllers. So uh, if that sounds like fun, why don't we go ahead and jump right in. Alright, so here's the PID controller we uh, drew last time and we showed how the control law to compute the control at a given time t was the combination of the term which was proportional to the error, right? That was this term right here. Let's call this maybe u proportional of t, right? Which corresponded to sort of this section up here. Right, and then we had an integral uh, ki term, right? So maybe let's call this entire term here. This is the control u due to the integral. Let's call it ui of t, right? Again, this blue corresponded to sort of this block down here. Okay, and then finally we had the derivative term, of the control right here. So this is the control signal due to the derivative. Right, which again corresponded to this sort of smaller subsection in the PID controller. Okay, so now what we would like to do is uh, while this might seem like a perfectly fine mathematical representation, we really should start seeing if we can poke some holes in this or ask ourselves can anything go wrong with any one of these signals? Right, um, so why don't we just go through this? Luckily for us, I think this green box is pretty bulletproof, right? This is about the dumbest control signal you can possibly have, right? It is just, you take the error at the current time, you multiply it by a number. How can that go wrong, right? Unless you have, you pick some ridiculous KP, like an imaginary number or something like that. As long as you pick a real number, positive, negative, you know, what have you, I, I, I have a hard time seeing how this is going to go wrong. So again, luckily, I think you're pretty bulletproof with this proportional part, right? With uh, obviously, as long as you're not doing something completely ridiculous. So let's leave this one alone. In fact, uh, then, what that means is we should more closely examine the integral and the derivative terms, right? And we're going to actually see that both of these might present some real issues if you're thinking about trying to implement uh, a PID controller, maybe in, say, a real-world system or on a digital system. So let's examine each one of these in turn, okay? So to make things um, consistent with the order of my notes, let's examine the derivative term first. So let's just focus focus in on only this red box in our PID controller and ask ourselves, can this signal possibly uh, go haywire in any uh, condition? All right, so I don't know about you, but one of the first things I like to do when I'm playing around with a controller or a control law is I like to kind of try to mock it up very quickly in Simulink just to see how it works. So again, focusing on just the uh, derivative term, we saw that it was pretty simple, right? All this thing was, was we needed a gain of magnitude uh, KD, right? So I don't know, let's go ahead, uh, come on, let me get, put the name here, KD. Uh, I don't know, let's pick some gain. How about, how about two, right? Okay, that's great, we got our uh, derivative gain here. So the next thing I need is a, uh, a pure derivative, right? So a pure derivative, I think everyone would agree, if you remember, a pure derivative is basically a single S. All right, a time, one time domain uh, derivative is a single s in the Laplace domain. So I just need to go ahead and get a transfer function that is just plain old s, or I guess you can think about this as s over 1, right? That's the exact same thing. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to do that. So I'll go over here to continuous. I'll grab myself a transfer function, right? And I want this transfer function to be a pure derivative, right? So we said, okay, all I need to do is change these numerator coefficients so that it is s and then need the denominator coefficient to be 1. So I think that would be something like 1, 0 over 1, right? Would everyone agree this is now a transfer function which is s over 1? Okay, so this seems innocuous, but check this out. You come over here and you try to hit apply, and then, oh no, look at this. You can't do this, right? It says that this is basically an improper transfer function, right? Because the order of the numerator is higher than the order of the denominator, right? So, 
huh, this is, you know, right off the bat, bringing this and trying to implement that pure uh, block that we flashed up on the board, right, of a, just a pure derivative followed by a simple gain, that's like a non-starter here in Simulink. So, tell you what, let's go ahead and uh, jump over to the board and talk about what happened here and how we can maybe get around this. All right, so we saw this didn't work so hot in Simulink, um, and we saw that the problem was here with this block S, right? This block S was a pure derivative, right? Okay, so what the idea with this pure derivative is, is E goes in, right? And it's E dot is supposed to come out. Right now, the reason that Simulink barfed on this is uh, it, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class here. But if you think about it, um, this transfer function, if we're trying to implement this in a numerical tool like Simulink, is basically taking this continuous transfer function. It's going to have to discretize that into a difference equation, right? Because it's in Simulink, right? Simulink doesn't solve uh, continuous analytical expressions, right? It basically does numerical approximations and discretizes all of your continuous dynamics into basically different difference equations. So again, um, maybe I'm going to just say dot, 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 since it's outside the scope of this current lecture. But if you try to basically discretize that block, what you're going to end up with is something uh, on the order of like uh, e, uh, e dot um, at time k is going to be e at time k plus 1 minus e of k uh, all over your sample time, let's call it T, right? So that's what it's doing via via discretization. Discretization, right? We'll get you something like this, right? And you might stare at this and you might say, okay, I don't know, what's what's the problem, right? This seems about right, right? The, the slope of this is the rise or the change in the signal over the run or the, uh, the, 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 the sample time here, right? So this seems reasonable, right? But here's the issue and here's the rub with these improper transfer functions is what ends up happening with an improper transfer function is when you discretize it, you get this difference equation and if you stare at this thing long enough, right, it's basically telling you to compute the error the, the time rate of change of error at the current time k, you actually need to know the error at time k plus one. So you need to be able to see into the future, right? So this is sometimes referred to as non, whoops, uh, non-causal, right? It's, it, you require future information to compute the current control signal. So that's why this is a non-starter, and that's why improper transfer functions in Simulink um, are, are a bit of an issue, all right? Because when you do the discretization, you get a non-causal difference equation, right? So that, that's not gonna work. Now, you might say, uh, okay, fine, that's a, that's a really minor issue, right? That doesn't seem like a big deal. You know, instead of using maybe like a forwards difference equation, why don't we use a backwards difference equation? So what I'm saying is maybe let's approximate uh, the derivative, right? If we saw that the real uh, expression is non-causal, why don't we just shift the indexing by one? So maybe let's call it, I don't know, E dot e tilde dot at time k right let's just make this the error at time k minus the error one step in the past right so you just really just shift the indexing of the numerator one back and then divide by t right okay now this looks a little bit more promising right this now is causal Right, this is a causal difference equation. To get an approximation of the E dot signal at the current time, I only need to record the error now and in the past. So this seems totally reasonable, right? You could implement this on a piece of digital hardware or in a numerical package like Simulink, right? So um, that's that's probably pretty great. Uh, the issue we should all should think about though is that uh, especially if we want to go over to a real piece of hardware or a system where this signal E is coming from maybe uh, a sensor which is measuring real signals, you always got to think about what happens if noise is introduced into this system, right? So what we're basically saying is, what if this signal E is not entirely pure? What if there's like a little bit of noise, you know, uh, whoops, sorry, I, I, I maybe should have written it like, like this, or so, you know, however you want to think about introducing noise into the system. Let's say that there's some noise 
N of T that gets introduced into this. Does this noise have any effect and how is that gonna influence our derivative term of my PID controller? How is it gonna influence this difference equation, right? So let's, let's write that down. How about, let's now consider uh, noise. Okay, so if that's the case, right, you would have this equation be something like E dot uh, of K is again, it's going to be E of K minus E of K minus one all over T. But there's going to be some noise associated with the, both of these, these error measurements at time K and time K minus one, right? And the noise is not going to be the same. So their, their difference, you know, maybe what we should do is let's just write this as some noise term like N of K. Okay. Right. And again, this is I, I am shooting a little bit from the hip here in the sense that I guess I wasn't careful. And this N is not exactly this same N. Um, I was trying to just conceptualize this picture over here. Maybe we should erase this just to kind of so we don't muddy the waters. All I'm trying to just say is that there's some noise being introduced into the signal somewhere. Right. OK, so let's just model it like this. Right. So here's the quantity that we want. Right. You actually want to know how did the true error change, but there's there's some noise corrupting this signal, right? So, uh, okay, this is, uh, we can easily break this up. So we could write this as, you know, E of K minus E of K minus one all over T, right? Plus noise over T, right? That's the exact same thing, just break up these numerator terms, right? So what we want is this term right here, right? This is the signal we're interested in, right? We want this. Because this is really telling us how did the error change in one time step, right? What is the rate of change of the error in one time step or E dot, right? Or, or our approximation of E dot, right? Okay. But you can't get this without getting this as, as well, right? So this is the noise that comes along with it. So this is the noise effect on the signal, right? Now, here's what we should think about. If you stare at these two things, you see that if this noise, right, is on the order of how much the error signal changes, this term is going to be at least as large as this term, if not bigger, right? And what makes this insidious is think about your time samples t, right? If you have a control system and you have the error versus time, right? You know, the real error signal, you know, might, might do something like this, right? What are you going to want to do with the delta t that you sample at in order to capture the, the dynamics? You are probably going to want to sample very, very quickly, right? It, right? This makes perfectly good sense. So these T's or the delta T's, however you want to think about it, your sample times, these are small, right? You want to be sampling at 100 hertz, uh, kilohertz, you know, 10, kilo, uh, 10 kilohertz. You, this is going to be small, right? So this signal E is not changing very much between these, between these samples. However, your noise now has a very good possibility to be on this order of, um, of change, right? And also, you can also see the T is in the denominator, right? So as T gets small, you almost amplify this amount of noise, right? For a given noise, as the T gets smaller and smaller and smaller, this term here gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So we've got an issue here in the sense that noise has a very high likelihood to sort of corrupt your calculation of the E dot signal, right? Um, okay, so uh, let's keep that in mind, okay? Uh, and also now, let's maybe jump back to Simulink and, uh, and, and I want to talk a little bit about this concept of our, uh, whoops, where, where am I pointing at? Uh, oh, here, right? This pure derivative versus our numerical, I should point to the right thing, right? Our numerical approximation of a derivative using a backwards difference equation, right? A uh, simple backwards integration, you know, uh, rise over run, okay? So um, let's do that. Let's jump over to Simulink and see if we can replace this pure derivative with something like this uh, and, and see where that goes.
All right, so coming back to this Simulink model we were dealing with earlier, let's first go ahead and deal with this non-causal issue that we discussed earlier. So we saw that this pure derivative is not going to work, so let's just go ahead and uh, basically get rid of this. Let's go ahead and delete that pure derivative. And instead, what we said is we are going to now go ahead and pull out one of these uh, numerical derivative blocks. So, oops, I don't know why that jumped around. Let me go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and turn the block name on for this. And basically, this is a derivative. Maybe we should call this like a numerical derivative, right? And if you double click on the parameter block, it says, yeah, it says numerical derivative, D-U-D-T, okay? Um, keep this in mind. We're going to come back to this uh, down here in the parameters. For now, this is fine to leave it as, po uh, as positive infinity. Um, but long story short, this is basically just a finite difference derivative uh, like we talked about on the board. And now you see, we can build this Simulink model no problem. This is working, right? So this is going to be E of T coming in, and theoretically coming out of this is going to be U D, right? This is the control signal due to the derivative term, because now we've got an approximate derivative. So this is basically, this is E dot, <laughs> right? And then we multiply by KD, and we get the control signal. So here you go. This is one way to get around that non-causal issue that we were discussing earlier. So uh, just to verify that this seems reasonable, um, let me pull up another Simulink model that I have kind of prepared uh, off screen. And it is really, really simple, <laughs> right? All I've got here is I've got a signal E, right? I'm just using a sine wave right now of angular frequency omega E. Um, I think right now I've just got this set to one right now. But again, it doesn't really matter. This is just some sine wave. And now what we're going to do is let's calculate its derivative E dot using that numerical derivative block we just discussed. And if I go ahead and run this simulate model, um, and let me pull over the scopes. This is the top scope. This is E. And let me see if I can maybe make this one a little bit smaller. So here's the error signal. And then here's E dot that is calculated via this um, numerical derivative block. And let me, again, let me pull over the scope and maybe let's see if I can minimize this so they look like we can see both of them together. And I think that seems totally reasonable, right? The top is the signal, the bottom of it is its numerical derivative. And as you can see, yeah, the top one is a sine wave and the bottom is a cosine wave. And you might say, this is totally fine, right? There's nothing wrong with this, right? This looks exactly perfect and exactly like what you would expect, right? And I would agree with you in this case where we have this nice, perfect simulation with no noise, this E dot block or E dot signal is calculated no problem using this pure derivative. Now, where it gets interesting is what if we were to corrupt this signal here with with some noise okay so to do that let's go ahead and do that right now let's go ahead and add some noise so let me go ahead and flip this uh like such okay so i'm going to do something like this okay all right and now let's go ahead and just get a uh uniform random number again i prepared this off screen and that really is not a whole lot of preparation all i basically did was set the the, the amplitude of the noise signal and again i've set this uh simulation to run at a constant sample rate um of time step d uh, t like we discussed on the board in fact if you really want to see that i can come here in the configuration parameters and i can show you right it's just a fixed step simulation with a a fixed time step of T okay and uh, yeah let's hook this up okay so now what we've got here is maybe I should not call this E any longer this is like E this is like the clean version of the error signal right and over here is your actual E of T which is noisy right let me clean this up a little bit okay so now this is where it gets a little bit interesting so this signal down here look at this we're taking a numerical derivative of the clean signal so this is really the 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 truth value of e dot this is what we want right again we want this signal e dot down here which is basically the derivative of the clean signal but really you are not going to have access to this signal. What we're going to get is we're going to get this signal over here. We're going to get this noisy signal, right? So what we need to do is we need to go ahead and let's go ahead and take this off. Whoops, branch this off. And I'm going to grab another one of these numerical derivatives blocks, which a second ago seemed to solve all of our problems, right? And now let me, let me space this out a little bit so we have a little bit more room and we can differentiate these and label all these signals so it's exactly clear what we're looking at. Okay, 
So coming out of this second derivative block, right? This is the e dot, which is like, maybe this is the actual e dot that you're gonna get, right? Because you are gonna calculate the derivative of the signal based on this noisy signal, right? So this is what we actually get. So again, maybe what we should do is let's put scopes on all of these so we can stare at them, okay? So again, if I save this and run this now, again, again, now let's look at this signal. So now you see that this signal, it's the original sine wave, right? But there's that noise on top of it, right? If you zoom in on this, you can see that what that uniform random number is doing is we're adding just random noise on top of the signal, right? Um, it's clearly, you can see the underlying carrier wave, but again, we've added this noise to it, right? So again, down here, this is the truth signal, right? This is what the pure derivative is supposed to look like, right? But really, this is what we are going to be able to use in our controller for control, right? So we need to look at what does this look like? And if I pull this up, oh man, that doesn't look good at all, right? <laughs> because uh, maybe again, let's see if we can stack all three of these up one on top of each other to talk about them. Uh, boy, it's not going to be, it's not going to make this easy T tell you what, let me, let me come up with a better way to do this. Let's go ahead and mux these. That's probably a, a better way to look at these. Let's look at this one and this one on a single scope. Okay. Something like this, 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 there we go. Okay. All right. Does that, does that make sense what we're doing? So this scope here, the bottom one is going to show both of the signals. So again, let me run this. Okay. So we can see them. And here you go. So <laughs> as you can see, not so hot. The blue signal down below, that is the truth signal, right? That is the one that we want, right? But we don't get that. We actually get this signal coming out of this numerical derivative as being ridiculously noisy, right? And this is exactly what we talked about on the board. Because our time samples are small, that little bit of noise up here, right? As you can see uh, in the original signal, right? The E signal, it's a little bit noisy, right? But that noise gets amplified to an unusable degree, right? I think you would agree with me in the sense that when I say that the yellow signal that we want to use for control, that really is not suitable at all because it does not represent the blue signal, which is underneath that if, if you zoom in here enough, I think we can see the blue signal, um, which is what we were expecting. Oh, crud, come on. Uh, where's the vertical zoom here like this, right? So the, there's our, there's the sine wave, but it is swamped out by the noise, right? So uh, this is basically uh, not going to work in a real life situation, right? This pure numerical derivative is a big problem uh, when we add noise to the system. All right, so let's update our diagram a little bit here. So uh, first off, right, we said uh, we this pure derivative, right, was a non-starter. In fact, maybe here's a good time to, to maybe throw out a little word of advice, right? Anytime, as a controls engineer, anytime you see an S hanging around all by itself, warning bells, klaxons, uh, alarms should be going off in your head for some of the reasons that we just discussed, right? So A, this is this is non-causal, right? So that's, that's the problem. So what we ended up doing, right, was, we said this pure derivative is not going to work, so we changed this thing to a um, uh, what was it? A delta u over a delta t, right? That's how Simulink represented it, and it's now not a pure derivative. This is a numerical derivative, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and again, if you see this hanging out by itself, those same warning bells and klaxons and red alarms, maybe they're not quite as loud and as piercing as they were before, but there should still be those alarm bells and 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 warnings going off in your head and red flags because like we just saw, if you have a slightly noisy signal coming in on this side of it, right? What this thing is gonna do is it's gonna blow up that noise and amplify it to an enormous amount and completely swamp the signal that you're looking at right again. So we saw that basically this numerical derivative is not a whole heck of a lot better than a pure derivative, right? Now, um, let's talk about this noise. So, in fact, the, what we can think about and learn from this is anytime you think about noise, right, what's the next thing that comes into your head, right? It's probably filtering of some type, right? You think that, okay, I got a noisy signal, right? If I have some signal that, you know, looks noisy, 
and again, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a horrible artist. I'm trying to approximate what we were doing uh, in Simulink, right? You got this noisy signal, right? This is your E dot signal, right, that we showed. Well, you got a noisy signal, probably what you want to do is filter it, right? So hopefully what you can do is you can maybe reduce some of that noise and get this to look a little bit more reasonable, right? That's the goal, right? So what kind of filtering is going to get you this behavior, okay? If you, again, if you think about this long enough, a more uh, descriptive adjective that we can add to this filter is instead of just a filter, we want this to be a low pass filter, Right, because we want the low frequency signals to pass through and we want to filter out the high frequency signals. Right, so really what we're talking about now is we're talking about this numerical derivative like a delta U over delta T, right? So we got a numerical derivative, right? And what we want to do now is here stick on a low pass filter. Right, and if you remember our discussions on uh, on Bode plot components, right? We had a completely separate video discussing what kind of uh, dynamic systems are going to get you a Bode plot response that looks something like you know this, where it's, it's zero dB, right? So here's your amplification, and then this is going to start rolling off, right? Because I want to now let the low frequencies pass through and I want to filter out the high frequencies right and I want to, all of this to start to start happening at some frequency maybe a radians per second right so again to get this type of a Bode plot this low pass filter probably needs to look something like an a over s plus a right so uh, okay this is now going to do a little bit better Okay, because what we're going to do is we're going to get this this noisy signal coming out. We're going to take this numerical derivative, which is going to amplify that noise, make this signal ugly. But then we are going to low pass filter the result to hopefully recover something that is is reasonable. Right. So this is the game plan. What's also interesting now is let's actually take sort of a step backwards. Instead of this numerical derivative, let's call this maybe let's let's go back to the pure derivative. Right? So now this is now a just a pure S. Okay? And again, uh, I hate to shamelessly plug some of our other videos, right? But we did talk about block diagram algebra. This is about the simplest block diagram algebra you can do. It's two blocks in series. I think everyone would agree this is the exact same thing as writing, right? This is now uh, what? It's AS over S plus A, right? So now you've got uh, the input E coming in, and then you've got, let's call this E tilde dot, okay? Because it's not the pure derivative, right? The pure derivative of this is this signal here, followed by this low pass filtering. We, we, we change the signal in some fashion, right? Okay, now the reason I want to write it like this is because this combined thing, let's call this, this is sort of like, it's it's a fake, it's not a pure derivative, right? It's a pure derivative followed by a low pass filter. So it's this fake derivative or like a pseudo derivative, right? So sometimes you'll hear this referred to as a pseudo derivative because again, it's not really a pure derivative. It's a derivative followed by a low pass filter. Now, what's great about this though is, is check this out. This has got a couple of things, right? First of all, Look at this. This is not an improper transfer function, right? The order of the numerator is equal to the order of the denominator. So you know what? We can run over to Simulink and I can implement this as a transfer function right off the bat exactly the way it sits like this, right? Secondly, this also solves some of our noise issues, right? In the sense that it does um, have this low pass filtering built in, right? Now, uh, what else is interesting about this, this pseudo derivative, remember in the, in, the, in the MATLAB screen capture, we just looked at where we were looking at the block parameters of this numerical derivative, right? We, we, we pulled in this numerical derivative block, I double clicked on it and opened it up and there were these block parameters, right? And I told you to keep that in the back of your head because we're going to revisit that. Well, let's revisit that right now, okay? So let me, let me flash up uh, a screenshot of what those block parameters are over here on the side.
And if you notice, <laughs> what it says in the MATLAB script there is it has a, a transfer function approximation for linearization, right? And it said in MATLAB, it was something like on the order of S over C, whoops, C S plus one, right? Right? This is what it said. It said basically what MATLAB was going to do is it was going to, uh, if you want to try to linearize that numerical derivative block, it was going to replace it with a transfer function like this. And again, you look at this thing, you say, what in the world is that? Well, let's go ahead and manipulate our pseudo derivative expression a, uh, a little bit. So our pseudo derivative was AS over S plus A, right? I think everyone will agree this is the same thing as, let me pull out the A here. So this is A and this is S over A plus one. Right? Would everyone agree? Okay, so these A's cancel, okay? And now let me make a substitution of let C uh, equal one over A, okay? So this whole thing becomes S over C S plus one. So look at that. This is exactly what we have in MATLAB. So what MATLAB is basically saying, right, is that if you want to linearize this numerical derivative block, it is going to just replace it with a basically a pseudo derivative with this coefficient c. So now you can basically see what is, oh gosh, I see, <laughs> this is a problem. You can see what c represents, <laughs> right? Right? So we see in this case that if c is positive infinity, right? And we said, okay, it's probably fine to leave this thing as positive infinity. This is basically corresponding to our pseudo derivative parameter a being what? Being, being zero, right? So a is zero. Right, which again, coming over here is basically telling us that the low pass filter is gonna kick in right away, right? Or it's like effectively not there. Oh, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, it, it starts right away, right? Um, okay, so this is all of, uh, long story short, all of that discussion is basically getting us to this block, this pseudo derivative. I really like this pseudo derivative because it helps us address a lot of these issues we have with the derivative term in our, in our, in our PID controller. So tell you what, let's run over to Simulink and now compare this pseudo derivative block against the numerical derivative block and, and see how it stacks up. All right, so here we are back at our Simulink model. And actually, you know, I'm staring at this. Let, let me rewire this slightly. I, I'm just gonna switch the order here of these uh, inputs. So I'm gonna put, I want the truth model to be up on the top, okay? So again, this is our truth value. And then down here, this is sort of our very first attempt at getting a uh, derivative, right? So maybe what, let's call this area, this is attempt uh, number one, right? We're using a numerical derivative, right? Okay, so this was our attempt number one at solving the problem. And again, let me just clean this up a little bit so we can get a little bit more space, okay? All right, so that was attempt number one. Now, let's go ahead and do uh, attempt number two, which is our pseudo pseudo derivative okay so we said the nice thing about the pseudo derivative was that we can basically implement it right off the bat directly using a transfer function and this transfer function looks like an a s over s plus a right this was our pure derivative followed by a single low pass filter right so let me maybe rename this thing as pseudo derivative Okay, so again, same thing. What we can do is let's feed it the same signal a E, right? Again, this is our noisy error signal. And now we want to ask, does, does this do any better than attempt number one? So let's go ahead and tell you what, let's add a third output to the MUX and I'll hook this up. And now um, I think I've already defined A in my workspace. I think I'm using A of 100 radians per second. Let's go ahead and just double check that. Yep, A is 100. So I think we're good there. So now what we can do is let's go ahead and run this model again and see if it improved the system at all. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Aha, this is looking a little bit better now. So uh, what we've got 
is again, we have the yellow signal should be the pure signal, right? Because that's input number one. Now, again, you can't see it because I think it's swamped by all this noise. The blue signal is our, our pure numerical derivative, which we saw was subject to all of those noise problems. And now this orange signal is our pseudo derivative signal. So it has cut down a significant amount of that noise. And in fact, I believe if we now zoom in a little bit um, to some of these regions, let me see if we can zoom in a little bit over here, just in this. There we go. You know, it looks like, uh, yeah, I can kind of see that sine wave underneath, right? The, the underlying carrier sine wave. So this is doing a little better, right? The orange signal looks a little bit more like a sine wave than, uh, than the blue signal for sure. So this actually brings up an interesting um, observation, right? Well, if one low pass filter was able to kind of help us, why not add a few more, right? We can basically just kind of daisy chain these together and see if that helps. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Let's, let's, let's do this right away. We don't need to go back to the board because I think this, this idea is very simple. So attempt, oopsies. I'm gonna change this area name to, oh man, if it's gonna let me, come on. There we go. Attempt uh, number three, it's a pseudo derivative derivative with additional filtering okay so what i mean by that is let's do exactly like we did up here with our pseudo derivative so i'll just copy the pseudo derivative and now let's just daisy chain on a few more of these low pass filters so i actually don't want an as over s plus a right i just want the a over s plus a right? Because now this is now not a pseudo derivative. This is a low pass filter, right? So this already has one low pass filter built in. Now I'm going to add a second. You know what? We can, we can add a few more. Let's add, I don't know, let's, for giggles, let's, let's add three additional low pass filters onto this, right? And now let's see if that helped our situation anymore. So again, we can go ahead and let's add a fourth output so we can compare all four of these together in one shebang, okay? And uh, run this model again, and here we are. Now we're cooking. Look at that, see that green signal? That green signal is, is looking pretty reasonable. In fact, why don't we just isolate that? Let's just look at only the green signal and the truth signal. So let me go change this to two. So I just want the truth value, right? This is what we're trying to compute, right? And we are gonna compute that using our attempt number three, which is our pseudo derivative with extra additional filtering. In fact, three of them tossed on, okay? So, uh, whoops, yeah, no, that's the wrong button. I wanna hit play run this model and now let's look at these two together look at that that is looking a lot better in fact i think if we zoom in i don't know why it decided to zoom out so much let's zoom in a little bit there we go this isn't looking so bad at all, right? So again, we were we want the yellow signal, but we can't get that yellow signal due to the noise, right? But this noise we see has greatly reduced. Now this blue signal, right, which is basically our, our pseudo derivative plus additional low pass filtering, this might be reasonable for control even in this noisy situation, right? Now, What's interesting about this is, is there's no real, there, there's no free lunch, right? You might start saying, well, if this is working, why don't I just daisy chain 15 of these low pass filters together to make sure I cut out all of the noise. Now you gotta remember again, from our Bode plot discussion, from our frequency response discussion, we know that every time you add dynamics by one of these filters, sure, you are reducing some of the noise, but you're reducing that noise at the cost at the, of the introduction of additional phase lag. Right. So what we're basically getting at, I'm saying is if this sine wave increases in frequency, we are going to start lagging behind it more and more. So just to see that happen, we can change this input frequency instead of uh, what am I using right now? Um, sorry, let me come back to my script. I'm using, OK, one revolution, uh, one radian per second. Let's go ahead and, and bump this thing up. Maybe uh, let, let's go up to how about 10? Let's go. Let's go a little bit faster. OK, let me rerun my initialization script. And then, whoops, sorry, I need to come back to my our model we were playing with. Ignore that error, <laughs> right, <laughs> that you saw flash up. If I run this again, okay, and we look at our, our best signal. Oopsie, uh, come on. Okay, now look at this. 
right? Now you can clearly see that our blue signal is starting to lag behind the, uh, the yellow signal, right? So we've introduced some phase lag in this situation. And this problem gets exacerbated if we increase the frequency of this signal even further. So instead of going 10 radians per second, let's go 50 radians per second, right? That's how fast the signal is going. And if I again rerun this and ignore that error because that's not relevant, um, but if I run this again, right, and look at the plot, now you can clearly see that the blue signal is out of phase and actually is also being attenuated. So we actually might have to ch change that, that corner frequency a bit um, to, to deal with this problem, right? So, uh, yeah, I think this is a pretty good... Whoops, let me move this out of the way. Right, this is a pretty good um, intuitive feel for what this pseudo derivative uh, plus the additional derivative filtering is doing for us. All right, so we saw that this this kind of works, right? If you take this pseudo derivative and then start daisy chaining on basically additional low pass filters, right? Something of the form A over S plus A. And in fact, tell you what, let's raise this all to the power of N, right? So this is basically N low pass filters, right? In series, right? And now let's move this E signal over here, or sorry, E tilde dot, right? This whole thing is basically a better representation of that uh, derivative, right? And I guess we, well, I forgot, I forgot the, the gain KD that we had up there, right? You need the KD, right? Maybe I, should, maybe I should do it like this, just so that the red lines are in the same locations, right? So here we go. This is a better way to go ahead and calculate um, the control signal from the derivative, right? So we started all the way back with this S, right? Which we saw was a problem. And now we've kind of matured it to this this situation, right? Now, before we leave this discussion, I do want to, to have a, a, a quick couple of minutes to chat about, you know, we can gain some insight into why this pure derivative S was such a problem when we started with it all the way over here, right? So this was our original naive sort of setup, right? Was just using this pure derivative. Right, and uh, a lot of the problems stem from this S. Right now, the reason why is is again you can understand this a little bit better. If we look at this in the frequency domain. Um, so uh, over here, this is a Bode plot of that pure derivative S. Right, as expected, it actually just increases at positive twenty decibels per decade, and it has a constant phase of nine of nine. 90 degrees, right? Uh, so you can j just look at that Bode plot. By definition, that is a Bode plot of something that amplifies higher frequencies, right? And in fact, the higher the frequency of the signal, it just amplifies it more and more. In fact, every decade that you go up in frequency, you amplify by positive 20 decibels, right? So that's, that's not good, because where does noise live, right? Noise lives in the very far right, right? Noise is typically very high frequency. So that is going to be amplified a ton, right? Now, that's that Bode plot. Look at the Bode plot now of our pseudo derivative followed by maybe say three low pass filters uh, in series with an A value of 100 radians per second, right? So I'll flash that up right over here underneath the other, other Bode plot so you can compare and contrast, right? Now you can clearly see that what this system down here does, this pseudo derivative plus additional filtering, what it does is sure it starts to amplify some noise but then it rolls off and actually filters out and attenuates that high frequency noise, right? So we don't get this noise problem that we were we were dealing with in the Simulink model, right? Now, of course, the price you pay for it is you can clearly see it right here in the Bode plot in the sense that at higher frequencies, in fact, above this corner frequency or above this break frequency A, right? That bottom Bode plot doesn't look anything like the top Bode plot. Therefore, this bottom system down here doesn't act anything like that pure S signal up, uh, over there. There. So it, again, if you want to take it, uh, the, the summary point there is that at higher frequencies, this thing that we've cooked up, this pseudo derivative with low pass filtering, does not act like a derivative, 
right? So if you are trying to do pure uh, derivative control, this block is not gonna do it for you, right? Because at higher frequencies, it doesn't behave like a derivative. Heck, that's why we set it up that way, right? Is because we don't want it to, to act like the derivative. Now, you can still, uh, you know, that being said, even though it doesn't act like a derivative, we can still take this into account in our in our design of our control system and, and deal with this gracefully, right? And in fact, in some future videos, we will show exactly how to do that. Um, um, using uh, the root locus technique. But again, uh, I, I think this is probably a good discussion right now. Um, the last thing I, I do want to talk about uh, here before we leave this concept of a derivative is one thing that's interesting to think about is what if there's a step change in the error signal? So what if the signal is, you know, it's, it's flat, 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 and then you get this, this, this discontinuous step, right? And this happens all the time, right? This could easily happen if you have a step change input in your reference signal, right, that the controller is trying to track, right? Maybe this is a temperature controller which is trying to hold your oven at 400 degrees, and then the user comes in and types in, oh, I actually want it at 450 degrees. Enter. When they hit the enter button, right, your step point goes from 400 up to 450. So this error goes from zero to another 50 de degrees of, of error instantaneously, right? Now, think about what's gonna happen if you try a pure derivative on this signal. What's the derivative of this signal at the time the step change is introduced? Isn't that infinite, <laughs> right? Because it's a discontinuous jump. So mathematically, you could potentially have real issues if you deal with, or if you try to implement this as a pure derivative or as a numerical derivative because the slope here is infinite. So what that's gonna do is that's gonna send an infinity through your signal, that's gonna send an infinity to your, to your control signal, which depending on what kind of actuator you have, that may be good or bad, right? Usually that's bad, right? I don't think I know a lot of uh, actuators that can handle an infinite uh, signal. So that's th this step change is bad with a pure derivative, but now you come over here and you think about this over here, right? If you use our pseudo derivative plus low pass filtering, right? This is effectively a dynamic system, right? It's actually a one n plus one order dynamic system, right? Because I see n plus one poles uh, in here. So long story short, if you introduce a step change over here, this system will gracefully actually take that into account and what you get out on the other side, it's not going to be a step change, right? It's gonna be some, some exponential change, right? Because there are dynamics in between e and e tilde dot. Right. So again, another little added benefit of, of using our pseudo derivative uh, plus additional filtering uh, technique. So uh, to recap, uh, we saw a pure derivative in your PID controller is not a great idea for all these reasons we've just talked about. Instead, uh, a better technique is just to use a pseudo derivative. And if that doesn't get you enough filtering, add on some, some low pass filters on this, right? So again, what we should probably do here is I'm going to change this instead of being a pure derivative, I'm going to use a pseudo derivative, right? And this thing is going to look like an A S over S plus A. Maybe let's just leave it like that. Right? So now we really don't have a PID controller anymore. Maybe you, we need to call this like a PID star or something, right? Because the D, it's not really a pure derivative any longer, but that's, that's, that's like I said, that's fine. We're gonna take that into account in our future control design. This is a much more robust con uh, way to implement derivative control in your system than using a pure derivative, right? Okay, I think we've beaten that topic to death. Uh, so uh, why don't we move on now to the integral term? All right, so now let's turn our attention to this blue box, uh, which is the integrator component of the PID controller. Um, so again, recall the whole idea with the integrator is that it integrates all of the error from time zero up to the current time and then multiplies it by this gain Ki, and that's the uh, UI component, right, of your control signal. So um, also keep in mind that uh, it, it might be helpful if we put this whole PID controller within sort of the larger block diagram 
diagram of what a typical control system might look like. So again, remember, right, with a typical controller, you have some reference signal, let's call it R of T, right? And then we are going to run this through a summing junction where we are going to compare it with the output of the system. The difference between the reference and the output gives us some error. Well, this error is this signal E of T here, which we then feed into our PID controller, right? And then that controller computes the control input U of T, which goes into whatever plant system you have, which then outputs or responds a signal Y, which we wrap back like such, right? So again, this is the architecture. So what I want to talk about now is let's examine within this PID controller, this little blue box, what could possibly go wrong, okay? Um, I think the easiest way to look at this is with a uh, kind of a thought experiment of an example. So let's plot several of these signals um, during a, you know, a typical, you know, hypothetical um, application of this PID controller to some system. So let's maybe on this plot, uh, this top plot, let's go ahead and look at both this reference and the output. So let's plot R of T uh, maybe in black and then I guess we can do this in a different color. Let's do uh, how about uh, blue for Y of T for the actual system response, okay? So uh, and then in the second one, let's plot the error signal here. Okay, and then down here, I want to look at the state of the integrator. So um, I guess we don't necessarily have a signal for this. I guess it's it's this signal right here that I want to look at. It's basically the, right, that is the state or the output of this integrator. Um, I guess what we can do, maybe one easy way to do this is consider, let's just assume maybe that Ki is uh, is one, it's just unity. So therefore we can just look at this signal UI, right? So again, here's UI, this was UP, this was UD, right? So if this is just unity, that's a, th this signal and that signal, the same thing. I just wanna avoid having to introduce too many names of signals, but really this is what I care about here. So let's plot this down here. So this is UI of T, okay? So let's think about what's going on. So what would happen? Let's pretend to start with that everything is hunky-dory. And what I mean by that is your command is something like this. Now let's assume the system is sitting at that command. So I'm trying to draw these two on top of each other, but um, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to illustrate, right? We're basically trying to say that the system Y of T is exactly where we're commanding it to be R of T. So again, if you want to think about this as a like a like a cruise controller or something like that of your car, the black line is how fast you want to be going. The blue line is how fast you actually are going. In this case, both of them are exactly the same value. So what does that mean? The error is doing. That means the error is zero, right? Maybe what we should do is let's draw a little dashed line so we can kind of do all of this like such, okay? So the error is zero, 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 right? Everything is fine. There's no error. Everything is like we said, kind of quote unquote hunky dory, right? And again, if we assume that maybe this is T zero over here, okay? What is the integrator doing uh, what is the state of this integrator? What is this signal UI? So again, we look at the control law and we're basically, it's saying you integrate this E signal from time zero to, to the current time here. So I'm integrating a whole bunch of zero. So this is it's also just zero. So the system is doing nothing, right? Okay. Okay. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Let's say at this time here along this dash line, what you would typically probably do is like, you know, what if you introduced a step input? So over here in this reference signal, let's say you're coming along, you're coming along then you're going to input a step. So this again, if, if for our cruise controller example, let's say you're cruising along at 50 miles an hour, you want to now jump up to 65 miles an hour, right? So at that time you introduce this step, okay? So that's easy to do in this R signal. So the R signal, it just jumps up, right? That's all this thing does, right? And then you want to be cruising along. This is what we're, we're doing, okay? So the question is, what do these other signals do? So let's go ahead and look at this R, uh, the error signal, okay? So your car obviously cannot respond instantaneously, so it's gonna still be down here. So at that point that when you introduce the step, you have introduced a finite amount of, let's call it positive error because R is greater than Y, right? R minus Y, that gives you a positive error. So this error signal here is going to jump up to some value, 
right? In our case, uh, using that example, it's gonna jump up to 15, right? This is gonna be 15 miles per hour or what have you, whatever you, you, you wanna think about it, right? So it's gonna jump up, okay? So uh, what that's going to do now in this error signal, right, is again, let's think about this a little bit of time, a little bit further along, All right? Something like this, okay? Okay, what is the control signal UI at this time? Well, what it's doing is it's integrating the error. So you can think about that as visually to integrate that this error isn't the integral of the signal, just the area under the curve. So that's like kind of this, uh, let me do it in a different color, maybe green, okay? As the integral of the error, right? So it's not a whole lot, right? Because even though there's a big error here, there's not a lot of time for it to integrate over. So you only get this area. So what I'm getting at is this signal, right, is going to start to increase. It's gonna to start to creep up, right? Okay, and let's keep going along. What's gonna probably happen is, again, here you, uh, the, the car is gonna start responding to this step change in velocity, right? So these other components like the proportional, mo mostly the proportional is gonna do a lot of the work here, but long story short, your car is gonna start accelerating up towards this set point, right? So maybe it's, uh, you know, well, let me see, uh, I don't know, let's, let's draw something you know, so, something like this, right? Maybe, maybe it just, it starts accelerating, right? Okay, again, let's go ahead and now maybe draw another dashed line. This is kind of a good critical point to look at what's going on. Okay, so the error, what does the error do? The error is, it's actually kind of the opposite of this, right? The error is just this minus this. So the error is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller like that right? Till eventually at this time, right? When the blue line touches the black line, you have zero error, right? Okay. Now the whole question is, what is the integrator doing <laughs> during this time? So again, you see, if we use this concept of area under the curve, area under the E curve, you see that we get all this here, right? Okay. So, uh, this integrator state is actually getting bigger and bigger and bigger because it's, it's, it's accumulating all of this error, right? So this is actually going more and more and more and more, right? And maybe it starts leveling off, something like that, right? Okay, so what's interesting is we could almost think of this, this chunk here, right? This green hash mark, this is like positive error. Right? And I guess if you want to see that picture up here, we said the, er the error, E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, is basically the difference between this and this. So again, you, you could also kind of visualize this as positive error, right? So these green hashes are the amount of positive error that the integrator has accumulated or wound up. You know, you kind of think about it, it's like winding up a, a, a one of those, those uh, to toys, right, that you wind up and you let it go, it's winding up all of this error, okay? So what, what gets interesting is let's think about what's going on right here, right? At this time where we drew this line, you got, the, the system is going the speed you want it to, right? The, the blue line has hit the black line. So ideally what you would like to do at this point is you should say, okay, that's great. The control got us to where we need to do. I just need to control to basically kind of stop a little bit, right? Because the system is where I need to be, so I should now back off. The problem here is actually, if you look at this, what is the integrator gonna do? The integrator is not gonna just stop, right? Because what it's done is it has, it has accumulated all of this positive error. So actually, the integrator is going to be pushing as hard as, it's, it's, it, 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 as it can at this time because it's accumulated all this error, right? It started off with a little bit of error, and then you got over here, it accumulated a little more, so it pushed a little harder. It accumulated a little more, it's pushing a little bit more hard. It's accumulated some more, it's pushing harder again, et cetera, et cetera. So and here at this point, it's actually pushing as hard as it, can, as it can. So what likely is gonna happen at this point is your system is likely going to overshoot uh, your desired set point, right? Because the integrator is now pushing really hard. So it's gonna overshoot, okay? Now, when it overshoots, now the response is greater than the command. So now the error signal actually goes negative, right? Something like that, 
Okay, and now you can almost think about this. Now this area is is like negative error. Let's do this in, in red, right? Right. So now you have this negative error, right, which is in this red cross hatch. Okay. So again, at this point in time, if we wanted to examine right here and ask ourselves what's going on, right? So the integrator now, it has accumulated all of this positive error, but now we're starting to chip away or eat away at that, at that, 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 uh, that, well, that bank of error that it has accumulated for itself um, in positive error. We are chipping away at it with this negative error, right? So the integrator is actually gonna come down, right? It's gonna start coming down, right? Something like this, right? And again, what's gonna probably happen is then that the system is gonna come back, hopefully till it hits the point again, right? And at that point, let's go do our little drawing like such, right? And again, we can fill in all of this with negative error area of error. <laughs> um, and the error signal like such is probably gonna be, again, it's gonna come back to zero because at this, at this point, the blue line touches the black line, so we have zero error. So now you got this bit like such, okay? And you see that it's gonna start coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down. It probably is not gonna come down all the way back to, to zero though, and we're gonna talk about that in a second, all right? So let's talk about this. Let, maybe we should do is we should write up a few of these. Uh, well, actually, I'll tell you what. Let's 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 go for a couple more oscillations of this. So ideally, what is going to happen, right, is you're going to you're going to repeat this pattern where uh, you have this 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 something you know this overshoot like such where you accumulate positive error here and negative error here. Okay, and again, let's also draw this uh, like such. Draw a couple more of these critical points so we can line all of our charts up so they hopefully look nice. Okay, so this, this the error signal is gonna go like that and then hopefully something like that and then kind of hopefully it will stay there. Okay, and this is gonna go, so this is positive error here. Right, so when you start accumulating positive error, this signal has to start increasing. Right, it's gonna increase, 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 and stop, because at that point here, we start accumulating negative error, which then chips away at the accumulated bank of error that's accumulated, and this starts coming down, and then hopefully like this, okay? Okay, so I think this is a reasonable picture, okay? So let's call out a couple of things that's interesting. So one, the first point I want to make here is this initial transient, or in fact, this entire um, behavior that you see of, of positive, negative, positive, negative, um, the integrator is, is keeping track of all of this and it's accumulating or integrating all of that error from time zero all the way up to the current time, right? So what's going on here initially at section one, right, is the integrator um, has quote unquote wound up or uh, accumulated, however you wanna think about this, accumulated, um, all this error, right? That's what happens here, okay? So what happens next is when you actually hit the set point, that's, that's bullet point number two, which is sort of right here and here to look at, right, is the system is likely to then overshoot due to the fact that it has wound up or accumulated all this error, right? So system is likely, or let's say, or, or can overshoot. Not all the time. In fact, we'll look at some situations where that's, this doesn't happen, but it's likely to overshoot um, uh, because, because what? Because the integrator at this point is pushing as hard as it can, right? And it's likely to drive the system beyond the set point, right? Because the integrator um, continues driving system beyond the set point, okay? 
Now, and then the last thing I would like to point out is item three is down here. If you notice, I drew it very explicitly like this, where the state of the integrator doesn't come back to zero, okay? And what's going on here is actually, if you think about this long enough, at steady state, let's say, let's say you reach perfect steady state where the system response, the blue line, right, is lying nicely on top of the black line, which is my, our command, right? This is ideally where you want to get to, and this is what an integrator is going to buy us, and I'll, we'll talk about that right in a second. But let's think about what's happening right here at, this, at, at, at steady state when everything, again, is back to quote-unquote hunky-dory and normal. So if you think about that, what is the error signal doing there? In that case, the error is flat. It's absolutely zero, right? So this is totally zero, right? So E at time steady state, this is zero, right? And what's also interesting, what about E dot at steady state, right? That's the slope of this line. Isn't that also flat, right? It's also zero, right? So if you look at back at your PID controller, if this signal here, E, is zero, what is UP? UP is zero, right? Because you got a zero times, I don't care what your gain is, this is nothing. So your proportional controller at steady state is doing nothing, right? It doesn't help you at all. Similarly, let's look at your derivative controller here. If E dot, right, this signal E dot is zero, again, I don't care what gain KD you got, this is also zero. So at steady state, your derivative is also doing nothing, right? It is not uh, contributing to the control at all. So at steady state, it all falls on the integrator, right? The integrator is doing 100% of the work or computing or, or outputting 100% of the control signal in order to get the system to maintain steady state uh, zero behavior, right? So what I want to call out here at time, in item number three is at steady state, Right? Um, the difference in a uh, positive area uh, error and negative error is exactly what is needed to hold the system at the set point. Right? So this positive, the green area, if I subtract the green area minus the red area, I'm gonna get this value, right? This delta is, this is basically how much the integrator has to work in order to maintain the zero steady state error, right? So um, again, maybe I'll let, let's, let's all take a step back and let that set in, right? Because this is actually really fascinating. The integrator is going to basically guarantee that you have zero steady state error, right? And at steady state, it's going to make sure that you have no error and it's doing all of the work, right? The proportional and the derivative part of your controller do nothing, right? And again, maybe, maybe, maybe that comment warrants a little bit of discussion because some people might be thinking, wait a second, how, how is the integrator going to guarantee that I have zero steady state error? Well, the way you could think about that is almost with a like kind of a counterexample discussion. Think about what if you did not have zero steady state error? What would the E signal look like in a case where you had non-zero steady state error? In that case, you know, maybe it's doing, you know, whatever, blah, 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 and it, do it does something like this right? And then it stays this way, right? So if that, that happens, right here you have non-zero steady state error, right? If that's the case, what is the integrator going to be doing, right? So again, the integrator is integrating all of this control, all of this error, right? This signal, it's the area under the curve. It's gonna start integrating all of this, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know, this looks like it's gonna go, it's gonna increase, it's gonna, you know, it's, 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 it's monotonically increasing, right? So this thing is gonna increase, 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 increase. And then you start getting here and that. Now you're saying, okay, I've got a system which has non-zero steady state error, right? Meaning this goes on forever. Well, what is the integrator gonna do? The integrator is just gonna start climbing. It's gonna start pushing harder 
harder and harder and harder and harder and harder up to infinity, right? So it is going to actuate your system and it's gonna make sure that it drives us to zero because in a linear system, you ca it, it can't remain at a non-zero steady state error because this signal will grow and become unbounded, right? So it has to drive it to zero, right? So again, sorry, I, th I think I might have, uh, you know, thrown out multiple things there. Uh, a, a lot of discussion in a short amount of time. I think these are important concepts. So maybe what we should do is, um, you know, again, we talked about this is kind of a, a general thought experiment, right? We better back this up with a real example and show this happening in real life, right? Well, <laughs> I guess in Simulink, as close to real life as we can get so let's let's go ahead and look at an example of you know our classic spring mass damper so I would like to jump over and look at a very simple system where you, you know again we've beaten this thing to death you've seen this a million times right where you've got this thing right so here let's measure the horizontal distance as z you know here's positive z or something like that so this is your plant model and all i want to do is i want to control the position z using a pid controller so this is the plant i want to examine right here is a spring mass damper right and again i think in the interest of time and since people have seen this like a million times before right this is just some linear second order differential equation we'll model it as a state space model and basically throw it into simulink then let's throw on a pid controller we'll basically build this and we'll experiment with different gains and see if we can see this behavior showing uh showing up okay so uh yeah let's let's jump over to simulink now all right so here we are in matlab i've just got a really simple script to kind of define the plant parameters so again this is a, a block with mass 2 a spring constant of 0 0.1 a damping ratio of 0.05 here's our state space a b c d matrix we're going to start the block here at 0 0 um in position and velocity okay and now i've just kind of out of thin air picked some gains kp ki and kd right here for our pid controller so if i go ahead and run this we can initialize all of those variables and then let me show you the simulink model that i built um, for the system. So as you can see, very simple. Um, it looks complicated, but it really isn't. It's exactly what we had on the board, right? Here's our plant, and then here's our exploded PID controller. Um, the thing that I maybe will uh, mention is, if you notice, let me come back to the MATLAB script. Uh, our KI is not unity like we had on the board. It's 0.15. So therefore, uh, I actually did have to instrument the signal. I called it XI for the state of the integrator here. And we want to differentiate that from UI, which is the actual control component due to the integration scheme. Um, again, they're only different by uh, a constant of 0.15. But again, just for to be completely explicit, let's instrument the thing fully and go from there. So uh, what we want to do with this system is, again, think about this as the block is starting here at zero meters and zero meters per second. And what we're going to do is we are going to try to control the position. We're going to make it go one meter to the left, or, uh, or excuse me, to the right. At one second, we're just going to introduce this step, uh, this unit step, right? So we want the control system to move the block one meter to the right. And we want to do that using this PID controller. So uh, we can do that. And then what I've done is I've just collected the relevant signals. And we can take a look and see what they all do during this, uh, this simulation. So let me go and hit play. Okay, and we'll run the simulation. Come on, come on, running, running. There it goes. Okay, let's open up this first uh, scope. As you can see, what I've done is I've collected um, basically the same thing we drew on the board, but now I guess instead of three <laughs> uh, subplots like we had on the board, I've actually got four, but again, these bottom two are just the difference between XI and UI. They're basically the same thing, right? They represent what the integrator is doing, which is really what we're interested in. So let me just drag that over here so you can see what's going on. And as you can see, this is pretty much exactly like we drew on the board, right? So for the first second, right, between time zero and one, everything was fine. The block was sitting at zero the controller told it to stay at zero so there was no error here right and as such the integrator state was sitting here at zero but then at one second we introduced this step we said okay block move one meter to the right right so the yellow line jumps up but the block can't move instantaneously so it goes ahead and starts working right but as you can see the integrator at this time 
has built up and accumulated all of this error. So it overshoots, et cetera, and goes along and along. And we see this oscillation pattern. And again, at steady state, check this out. We have zero steady state error, right? The error goes to zero. So the block does move over to one meter exactly where we want it to be. And take a look at this. Look at the, uh, the output of the integrator. So this is UI, right? The control due to the integrator scheme. It is sitting here at 0 0.1, which again, makes sense right if you think about this uh we told the block to move one meter to the to the right and i guess if we come back and look at the uh the script right there's a spring constant of 0 0.1 uh um so in order to move it right we basically have to apply a force which is equal to the spring constant deflected at one meter which is 0 0.1 newtons right so great that all checks out now, what we can also take a look at is, let's also look at all of the other signals, the proportional, the derivative, and the integral all together. So if we take a look at this, again, check this out. The proportional part does quite a bit initially, right? And again, that's what we discussed earlier. That's what a PID controller does. That's what the P is for, right? It provides that initial proportional response. And again, we see this issue with the derivative that we talked about earlier, right? In the sense that it is swamped by this step input and error because the slope there is infinite. So the derivative is doing like this infinite spike here. So it's actually a little hard to see what's going on because it got washed out. Um, you notice that we are using a stupid derivative, not a fancy pseudo derivative in, in this case. So that's why this signal gets ridiculous at the time of the step introduction. But long story short, at the end of the day, I think if we were to zoom in, oh gosh, I don't know if I want to do this. This is going to take probably forever to zoom in. You're going to have to take my word for it that this derivative is basically zero. Yeah, this is going to take me forever to zoom in. Um, well, actually, maybe it's not. I'm on, here, at eight, 10 to the seven, six, five, four, <laughs> yikes, three, uh, come on, we're almost there. Okay, okay, we're getting there, we're getting there, we're getting there. Come on, come on. Okay, here we go. Great, there we go, there we go. Now we can see the derivative. Okay, that's what the derivative is doing, right? But the thing I was trying to get at is the proportional part, look at this, at steady state, it's doing nothing, right? UP is zero. Same thing with UD, it is all zero. So it is just the integrator that is doing all the work at steady state and it's providing all of the force that's needed to move that block one meter to the right, okay? So in this case, we saw that there's this this oscillatory behavior that we just described on the board. But I do want to show you that while we're sitting here, this, this isn't always the case. Remember, take note here, it takes about a force of 0.1 newtons to move the block over, okay? So uh, the reason I want you to keep that in mind is if we come back to our script, let's just reinitialize some of these. For example, let's let's change these gains. So let's let's get less aggressive. So let's divide this by 10. So let's reduce the uh, proportional gain by a factor of 10. Let's reduce the uh, integral gain by a factor of uh, 15 or something like that. Let me rerun this, okay? So we'll reinitialize those gains. Now, bring up the Simulink model. Let's rerun this simulation with these new set of gains, okay? And now if we look at that same pa uh, set of charts, let's go ahead and zoom them all out. Look at this. In this case, we do not get uh, that oscillatory behavior because the signal stays below sort of the necessary steady state value that was needed, right? It stays below this 0 0.1. But again, we see that it still achieves zero steady state error, right? We, as we discussed, as long as you have a non-zero integrator Ki gain in there, we should uh, the system should eventually achieve um, the, the set point you, you ask for, right? It's not going to allow you to remain with a non-zero steady state error. And again, if we examine the, uh, the UP, UI, and UD all together, again, we see also similar behavior in the sense that at steady state, the proportional controller is doing nothing. Oh, crud, I didn't want to hit the automatic. Ah, shucks. Uh, I'm not going to bother zooming in again. I think you're going to believe me, right, when I said that the proportional and the derivative are doing nothing. And again, the integrator at steady state is doing all of the work to clean up that error. All right, so we saw how that affected the spring mass damper system. Now, this entire phenomena of the integrator accumulating this error is uh, sometimes referred to as integrator windup.
And uh, now I think you can clearly see where it gets this name, right? It's accumulating or winding up all of this error, which has the potential to cause these issues. Now, obviously, we looked at it with this sort of toy academic example of the spring mass damper, but um, it's actually not a, a, <laughs> a purely academic problem. Um, this has actually caused incidences with uh, real engineering systems. So um, for those of you who are, who are followers of the channel, you know that uh, I'm in aerospace engineering. And in fact, when I was a grad student at the University of Washington, I actually got to work uh, a lot with a company called in situ. So in situ is a, uh, it's a UAV company. Um, I, I was about to say small UAV company, but it is not small any longer. It's quite large. In fact, in uh, 2008, it was acquired by Boeing. So I guess it's technically Boeing, which is uh, the uh, definitely not a small aerospace company. But uh, long story short, in situ, it started out as a small grassroots company founded by uh, Dr. Tad McGear um, in uh, 1991. Uh, and what he and some colleagues actually at the University of Washington did is they built an aircraft called the Aerosond. The Aerospond is a small, uh, long range, endur uh, long endurance UAV. And what they did was back all the way in 1998, they demonstrated that they were able to fly that aircraft autonomously across the Atlantic. So it was the first unmanned system to do a transatlantic crossing, again, way back in uh, 1998. So it was about a 2,000 mile journey. I think it took about 26 hours and it was completed on uh, 1.5 gallons of gas. So again, that's pretty amazing uh, back in 1998 that this was feasible. Um, what's interesting about that story though is uh, there were actually three, they launched three aircraft uh, in an attempt to make this crossing. So the first one was an aircraft named uh, Trumper. It was lost at sea. I believe they don't actually know what happened with it. The second aircraft was an aircraft called Piper and it actually crashed immediately uh, very shortly at launch. And then the third aircraft, which was uh, called Lima, actually did successfully make it across the Atlantic. And that is the one that is actually uh, now hanging in the Museum of Flight uh, in Seattle, Washington, where uh, it's there amongst a lot of other historic aircraft. In fact, you know, here's a picture of it hanging in the Museum of Flight. Um, <laughs> the thing that's ironic here is this aircraft now is, is you know, literally steps away from my office right now. And when I was a grad student, here is the, uh, if I looked up and saw what was hanging above my head, this is actually my view. As you can notice, this is also an Aerosan. This is another aircraft called Fester. Um, because, like I said, the University of Washington was actually very involved with uh, this transatlantic crossing. In fact, uh, a lot of the story that I want to tell you now comes from uh, Professor Juris Wagner's, who was, uh, he's actually the one that was in charge. He named uh, that aircraft Lima, the third aircraft that successfully made it across the Atlantic. He was the one that chose the name Lima um, after his Latvian heritage, and Lima is apparently the deity of uh, good fortune. So it was kind of uh, interesting that that was the one that made it across. But anyway, I, th I think I'm getting distracted from this. Um, what I want to do is kind of talk a little bit about what uh, some of the stories that he has told me uh, about what actually ended up causing uh, aircraft number two, which was Piper, which was uh, what, what caused the crash. And actually, it was related to integrator anti uh, integrator wind up here. So uh, to set the stage for this, um, I, I guess what we can do is, you know, let me let me just let me draw this in a horrible fashion. Here's the United States. I, oh, gosh, I'm not a, I'm not a good artist. Texas, Florida, whatever. Right. So they wanted to launch. Um, they actually launched, I believe, from uh, Canada, actually. Uh, but anyway, on the west side of the Atlantic, right? Here's the Atlantic Ocean, right? Okay, and they actually flew to the Scotland. Okay, so what the aircraft was doing, it was, it was going to follow a series of waypoints to go from the launch place point over to Scotland and make this 2,000 mile transatlantic crossing, right? So what they ended up doing was they launched the first aircraft, Trumper, and Trumper left um, 
and it was lost somewhere at sea. They don't actually know what happened to it. So what they ended up doing with the second aircraft, which was Piper, is they wanted to do some preliminary pre-flight checkouts before they sent it off on their way. So the way that the aircraft operated, uh, apparently, again, a lot of this is uh, from stories from Professor Wagner's, is that the aircraft, you know, you've got the aircraft, you know, let me, let me just draw a an aircraft, right? If it has some cross-track error, right, here's some error, and what it would do is it would try to basically bank to turn and converge with the with the flight path, right? So if it was too far uh, uh, to the to the left of the f desired flight path, it would bank using the ailerons and turn back on track, right? So the idea was hopefully this control law, this steering law would kind of, this guidance law would get you to converge with the with the desired flight path, right? So there was basically a control system which had a PID component to it, which basically mapped the aileron or the bank angle of the aircraft to the cross track error, okay? So what they were doing with the second aircraft Piper is that um, due to the failures of Trumper, they were basically flying like some racetrack patterns out here at launch while they were doing uh, checkout maneuvers, right? So the aircraft was flying around like such, right? In this pattern, right? Now, what's interesting is that the autopilot, right? This controller was on during this uh, this checkout phase. So as you can clearly see in this case, there is a constant error in cross track, right? So this is a problem because exactly like we talked about during this time when it's doing this checkout, you know, maybe they're flying for, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, how, who knows how long they're actually flying around doing your checks, all this kind of good stuff. The integrator is winding up and accumulating all of this error, right? Now, what they end up doing, right, is usually when they're doing this racetrack pattern, they would send a ground station command to switch the aircraft from uh, from sort of manual mode over to automatic flight mode, where it would then track the, way, the, the guidance, right? So they had properly accounted for this integrator error in the situation where the signal comes from the ground station, right? They, they basically had software on board that said, you know, if I receive from the ground station a command Command to go from manual to automatic flight mode, right? Tracking this way, this place, reset the integrator and then go on your way, which is exactly what you want to do, right? That's exactly taking into account this problem. But what ended up happening while they were flying this with Piper is there was a temporary intermittent unplanned communication comm loss between the aircraft and the ground station. And in that case, the autopilot comes on automatically. And in that one weird edge case where the automatic pilot, or where the autopilot takes over automatically, the integrator was not reset properly in that scenario, all right? So as you can imagine, that is a big problem because if the integrator has wound up all of this error at that point and you switch it over and don't reset it, what's it gonna do? It's going to turn really hard, right? It's gonna bank hard to try to get to this location. So yeah, maybe the aircraft is able to kind of get here, right? But because it has wound up all of this error as we've discussed, right? It is gonna overshoot this trajectory really badly, right? And in fact, it's gonna keep going and going and going and that's what ended up happening. It crashed into the ocean uh, right after takeoff, right? The ailerons went right over the aircraft, banked really hard and basically um, they, they they lost the aircraft. <laughs> um, in fact, here, here's a picture from, and, and actually this is from uh, actually Dr. McGear's uh, write-up of the entire transatlantic crossing. So this is about as close to from the horse's mouth as you can get, right? Because Dr. McGear, again, remember, he's the founder of in situ. He's the one that made these aircraft and was the one flying this transatlantic crossing. Um, now, he didn't explicitly call out the integrator anti-windup here, but that's actually what, I, like I said, that's what I heard from Professor Wagner's, and it makes a lot of sense here. And again, I think it's very, uh, I may have taken some liberties to make the story fit with our discussion of this windup, but again, combining the first-hand accounts of basically two of the most informed people in this situation, I, I it's a story that I've been telling and I think it's somewhat reasonable. Um, if you're interested, I will leave links to uh, several articles that uh, outline this discussion. Again, this this was pretty amazing that they were able to do this back in 1998 
um, and have a 2,000 mile transatlantic crossing. But again, it's interesting that this, this simple idea of integrator windup still has the potential to kind of work its way in. And again, it's something that you want to be aware of. Um, now, uh, in fact, you know, let's actually simulate this. I actually have a, uh, have a simulation of a simple vehicle flying around. Now we can almost kind of recreate this and examine and see, would that cause this problem? Would this have the potential to actually crash an aircraft um, if you don't take into account this, uh, this uh, integrator anti-windup? So let's go ahead and uh, jump over to Simulink again. All right, so here's a Simulink model I built that uh, we're going to use to try to simulate that Arison uh, scenario. So uh, the first thing I want to show and call out is that the plant vehicle that we're using, or the plant model, it's actually this simple planar vehicle. It's not a full aircraft. Um, again, we did discuss the dynamics of this planar vehicle in this video here, so feel free to check that out if you want to understand uh, what's actually happening under the hood. Again, uh, in, in a quick summary fashion, I'll just tell you that this is basically a very simple vehicle which is restricted to move in the XY plane which is perfectly fine for what we want to demonstrate here um, again and in a shameless plug for another video if you are interested in uh, making a model of a full six degree of freedom rigid body nonlinear aircraft stimulation why don't you check out this video where we discuss the research civil aircraft model which is a lot higher fidelity model but uh, again in this case all we need to do is look at a vehicle moving in the plane and see if this can be used to replicate that integrator windup problem that we discussed. So again, um, I'll quickly walk you through this diagram and this control system just to show you what's going on. So here, this controller is what we're mostly interested in looking at. So what this controller does, it is a, it's a PID controller which looks at the error in the heading angle and it basically controls um, a moment thruster which can basically change the heading of the vehicle so long story short all this controller is it's a PID controller that is trying to point the air uh, the vehicle in the direction of the next waypoint so I've got a very simple guidance loop outside which is basically in charge of guiding the vehicle to successive waypoints as it goes uh, you know quote-unquote across the Atlantic Ocean in fact let me show you I already ran the simulation and I'll show you kind of the rough trajectory that we are simulating so we've got the vehicle starting down here um and basically you can see that i've got one two three four five six waypoints in sort of this kind of zigzaggy fashion which kind of goes eastward so again this is our this is our simulation of going across the atlantic ocean uh yeah so that's what's going on in this picture and as you can see the trajectory of the vehicle is it starts out here and if everything works out fine it starts from its initial condition and it basically goes to the first waypoint and then it goes to the second waypoint then the third and then the fourth and the fifth and the sixth before it starts kind of circling around and around and around at the last waypoint which is hopefully in Scotland right where the aircraft ended up um, and in fact instead of me just talking through this trajectory again remember this is the normal trajectory what we can actually do is I've actually got this plugged into a Simulink 3D animation visualization that I made again um, I have another video discussing how to build uh, virtual worlds in Simulink 3D animation but let me just pull it up and we can see what this looks like in sort of simulated real time. Uh, whoops, let me, let me change this to looking straight down. Okay, let me rerun this simulation again and you can see what happens in the normal case. So we start our initial condition, we're heading towards the first waypoint here, then we make a turn and we head towards waypoint number two and then it turns and goes towards waypoint number three and then again the heading turns and et cetera, et cetera and we end up going exactly where we want to and we successfully cross the Atlantic ocean uh in this scenario because right here we uh yep we're at our last waypoint right so all that looks great and again what we can do is we can look at this pid controller and let's look at the integrator state right here so you can see i've already hooked up a scope to this integrator state and you can see in the normal case this looks totally fine right the integrator state doesn't wind up to a a very large number until we we successfully cross the atlantic here at you know 1200 seconds in the, into the simulation so again, everything seems totally fine in this particular scenario where everything is running in the nominal case. Now, what I want to do is instead, let's change the simulation. And what I've got right here is I have another block, which is basically trying to simulate manual control. 
So what's going on here is that the the uh, the pilot is going to be manually flying the aircraft in a sort of uh, racetrack pattern, and we are going to be listening to this manual control for the first I think 600 seconds. And while we're doing that, um, we're going to let this this controller out here integrate the error. And then we are going to simulate that calm failure. We're going to simulate switching over to the autopilot at 600 seconds. Okay, so that's the game plan that we're going to use to try to emulate what happened with the aerosol. So let me go ahead and reinitialize some of these variables. And oops, oh, sorry, uh, crud. I didn't want to actually run the simulation. Sorry, hold on. Let me see if I can I can pause this. Let me let me let me break this out of the sim, and I just want to come back to to this. And let's go ahead and again open up the Simulink 3D animation. Now here's the 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 new scenario. So let's hit run again. And now okay, now you can see the the manual operator is flying it in this racetrack pattern. And right now the integrator state is winding up and winding up and winding up. Now right now we're going to simulate switching to autopilot. And oh my gosh, look at that. It, the integrator is trying to unwind right now, and boy, this looks like a crash to me, right? This is not a good situation. In fact, let me stop this because we've, we've long since crashed, and instead, we can go and look and see what ended up happening. So again, if we come in here to the moment controller and look at the integrator state, you can see this is the problem, right? When we were in the that racetrack pattern for the first 600 seconds, look at what's happening, right? The integrator is just winding up and accumulating all of this error as we were as the vehicle was flying kind of eastward and then turning around going westward and then eastward and westward and eastward and westward. And then when we had that calm failure and the autopilot switched on, suddenly uh, the the vehicle I mean, the integrator was just out of control at this point, right? It was outputting a a really hard turn left or turn right uh, command, which the vehicle is just not able to recover from after that, and we basically crash, right? So I think this is actually fascinating that this very somewhat simple uh, model here <laughs> is able to kind of replicate and predict this problem that we saw in a in the more complicated case um, of the Arison. So again, uh, I think the power of this simulation is that it shows how this integrator windup can literally come back to bite you and basically uh, uh, drive your system unstable and destroy your, your your vehicle, right? So this is the problem. Now I guess the question now is, okay, uh, how do we solve it? All right, so now that we have a uh, pretty good feel of what the integrator does and where it can go wrong, let's think about how we can uh, address some of these issues. So what I want to do now is walk through uh, four potential candidate solutions uh, to fix this problem of integrator windup. So the first one here is uh, the idea of just gradually increasing the set point. So what do we mean by that? So we saw earlier that if this reference signal, if this was uh, a sharp step right if it was something like that what would end up happening right is that again the set point is you know you're down here at, at where you want to be and the system is happy exactly sitting here at the reference I'll draw this again in blue right and then at this time you maybe decide to change the set point. So we, we, we jump up the set point, we introduce this step input in velocity, or I guess in our mass spring damper system, right? It was a, it was sitting here at zero, and then we moved it to one meter to the right, okay? That's what the command signal, R of T, looked like. And the issue was that the, sprint, the mass couldn't respond instantaneously, so it would have to do something like this, right? And during that time, we saw all of this error integrate up, right? So here was basically the, the integrated error in this signal, okay? So instead of this sharp step, maybe the better thing to do would be instead of using uh, the black line as R of T, what if we did something a little bit more gentle, like, uh, you know, something like, uh, like this. What if this was your reference? You know, okay, so this is like R, of T, maybe let's call this RT tilde, right? It's some new reference signal, okay? So 
if you look at this, one way you can actually easily achieve this is by adding what's called a pre-filter on that R signal. So what we mean by that is if you come over here, Okay, so still we are going to allow the user to specify step inputs, right? Because there's nothing we can really do about stopping what the user is going to ask for. But what we can do is what we introduce to the control system is we won't subject the control system to this violent step. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to add a pre-filter. Let's call this like P of S. Okay, so this is sometimes referred to as a pre-filter, right? So the reference signal is over here, I guess. Okay, and now we have this R tilde signal. Okay, so the idea with the pre filter is we were, are going to want to take this violent, you know, abrupt step and we are going to want to turn it into this nice response like that. Right? So if we're able to achieve this, hopefully what ends up happening is the control system doesn't see the black line, the control system sees the red line, and therefore the amount of integrated error, right, is a lot less, right? Because we don't, we're now we're not gonna have all of this up here, right? We're gonna have this amount down here. Right, which is a lot smaller, so you're not winding up as much error in this integrator, right? So, a couple of things to think about with this pre filter. Uh, there's many ways you can pick this pre filter, but when you're doing your pre filter design, there's a couple of things you may want to think about, right? So the first thing that you probably want to make sure happens is that you want this pre-filter to have a DC gain of unity, right? Of one, right? Because what that will ensure is that even then that if the user specifies like this step the uh, in black, the red signal will eventually come up to the value that the user specified, right? So it will eventually tr uh, have the same steady state value um, as as uh, the, the user specified R, right? R, R tilde will eventually converge to R. So uh, hopefully the control system will still go to the same spot. It will just do this in a much more gentle fashion, okay? So again, um, remember what that means is that your pre-filter P of zero needs to, equals, needs to equal one, right? Uh, again, if you need a refresher on DC gain, right? We have a completely separate dedicated video talking about the DC gain of a dynamic system. So I'd recommend watching that. Uh, to, to understand this a little bit. Um, the other thing you also want to think about, number two, is you want to choose the bandwidth of this pre-filter so it doesn't handicap your overall system. Okay, so you know, let me just write that down. So the second thing you want to do when you're designing this is you want to choose a bandwidth that doesn't, uh, I'll call it handicap, uh, I think I spelled that wrong, handicap uh, the entire system, the entire closed loop system, right? Because if you look at this over here, what we've done is we've added this pre-filter. It's in series with the overall rest of the control system. So this thing right here is going to basically be the bottleneck or the choke point in terms of how um, uh, the bandwidth of the overall system. So if you choose a really slow pre-filter, yeah, you will definitely make sure you're not integrating a lot of error, but you're gonna make it so this entire system cannot change and respond to rapidly uh, uh, changing uh, reference signals. Right? So it won't be able to track um, ag uh, aggressive signals or changes. Uh, so again, uh, this, this concept of bandwidth, again, we have a completely separate other video discussing bandwidth. So again, if this is a new concept to you, check out the bandwidth video um, to understand this second bullet, okay? So uh, yeah, the pre-filter, it's actually very, very, uh, it's a very, very simple idea. And one other thing that's really nice about the pre-filter um, that I'll maybe mention is that that if you design this pre-filter to be a linear system, look at this. Actually, everything is still a linear system, right? Assuming you're, that your plant model is, right? Um, so this plant model would be linear. This PID or PI pseudo D controller, whatever, this is still linear, right? This pre-filter, if you choose this to be a, you know, a simple low pass filter or something like that, this is linear. So the overall system is linear. So you can still 
will analyze this entire system with the pre-filter using any linear analysis tool. There's still concept of closed loop poles, open loop poles, uh, you know, um, robustness, frequency response. All of those things are still valid because you still have a perfectly linear system. Okay. So uh, to tell you what, let's let's go see this pre-filter in action. Let's go back to that mass spring damper system in Simulink and just throw on a pre-filter and see if we can uh, cut out some of these oscillations and some of these issues with the uh, the integrator windup using a, a very simple pre-filter. All right, so here we are back at our script for initializing our spring mass damper system. Let's go ahead and change these uh, these PID gains back to the values that introduced a, uh, a lot of oscillations. So again, let me just run this script to initialize and then let's pull up our model. And again, hopefully this is all completely familiar. You've seen this before. So let's go ahead and run this. Again, it's the exact same model we looked at earlier. And let's go ahead and pull up this scope so we can see what the system did and again here we are uh this is the same thing we saw earlier it's got all these oscillations due to this uh th this wind up right and you can clearly see right here here's where the step in uh, the step in r is introduced and uh the 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 mass just doesn't respond so we integrate all this error right here where my mouse is okay so now let's go ahead and add a pre-filter to this system. So what we're going to do is let's just go ahead and maybe I'll break this signal here and do like we did on the board. And all we're going to do is we're going to jam in here uh, some dynamic system with the properties we discussed, right? The DC gain of one and uh, all those other good stuff. So in fact, here, tell you what, here, look, this, is, this will work, <laughs> right? This is basically uh, a very simple pre-filter. Right, and I can just use a default parameters because this is a low pass filter with a DC gain of unity and a uh, roll off frequency of about one radian per second. Right, so um, you know, for giggles, maybe what we should do is let's also put another scope right here and we can compare the two. Whoopsie, sorry, that's not what I want. I want a normal mux. Let's go ahead and look at R. And then this signal right here, I think we call this R tilde on the board. It's basically the reference that we're sort of feeding to the control system. And let me see if I can arrange this to be a little bit nicer. Okay, so now let's go ahead and actually before I hit run, let's pull up the scope so you can see. So again, here's the before. This is with no pre-filter. So look at this. The uh, the maximum overshoot is about, I don't know, uh, something over 1.5. I don't know, 1.6 or something like that. Now, if we run this again... With this pre-filter in the loop, let me see if I can move this down so you can w watch the blue signal. Let's see if we improve on the blue signal at all. And also, look at the, the this yellow signal, right? The yellow signal is technically, I guess this is R tilde. Um, oh, actually, no, I'm, I, I apologize. Look at this. Oh, crud. I, I, have, a, uh, I have a mismatch in <laughs> nomenclature. Shucks. Uh, really, what we want to be looking at is, tell you what, let's... Let me, uh, let me let me flip this. Let me move this over here. Okay, I'm gonna rename this signal to R tilde. Okay, and then actually we also have to update our scope tag. So this signal should go down to here. This is R tilde because I really want to show what the controller is seeing, right? The pre-filter is all before the controller. So I really care about what is the reference signal here that we're feeding to the control system. So that's what I wanna look at. I wanna look at the pre-filtered version of the command signal. So, okay, I think this is all pretty reasonable. I guess I can change this tag just so I'm completely consistent. Um, okay, now I think we're all right. So again, look at the blue signal and then now also look at this yellow signal. We expect this yellow signal, which is R tilde, should, should, should roll off a little bit. It shouldn't be such an abrupt, uh, sharp step input. So here we go. Three, two, one, click. Come on, go, go, go. There we go. Aha, look at that. See, uh, our tilde is now a little bit smoother, right? And now look at this. We don't have a one, uh, 1.6 overshoot. Now it's like 1.4. So we're helping with the overshoot, but you know, as you can see, there are still some oscillations. Um, and again, we are feeding the, the user is still inputting that exact same step input, except now what we've got is that if we want to compare the two, 
We can see this right here by looking at this scope. So again, the yellow is this original step input, which is, yeah, a pure discontinuous harsh step at time equals one second it jumps up to one meter but instead what we're feeding to the control system is this gentler blue signal right this r tilde signal now we can keep going with this right so um if we want to get rid of some of these oscillations let's just let's just make this pre-filter even slower right so i don't know how about instead of one let's make it 0 0.5 and again i have to change the denominator coefficient to 0 0.5 as well right so again we still have a dc gain of one here it's just this thing is going to act a lot uh it's going to act slower so actually tell you what let's look at this plot and maybe we'll open that up and hit play at the same time so you can watch this pre-filter signal hopefully get a little bit less aggressive and actually let me let me see if we can see multiple of these at one time <laughs> sorry I'm, I'm, I'm rearranging stuff on the fly uh okay now let's hit play again what we should see is we should see this blue line here get a little bit less aggressive which should in turn hopefully make this response less oscillatory so here we go three two one click and it's going going there you go look at that so it's doing better. We're getting, instead of what, uh, overshooting to 1.4, now we're down to 1.3, right? So let's, let, let's keep going. Let's, let's make this even slower. How about uh, 0 0.1? Okay. Great. All right. Hit play again. And aha, look at that. We have now totally got rid of the uh, the oscillations. Well, I guess not totally. You can kind of see it does oscillate a little bit. But as you can see, the amount of error that the integrator is allowed to accumulate is much, much less. So we don't have a lot of this oscillatory behavior. However, uh, you know, as with everything in engineering, everything's a trade-off, right? Like, as we are making this pre-filter slower and slower and slower, we're basically handicapping the system in terms of its bandwidth and its ability to, to settle in a reasonable amount of time. So, you know, right now, uh, I don't know, this is settling in, I don't know, 40 seconds, I don't know, 30, 30 seconds or something like that, right? And we still have these oscillations. We could completely get rid of these oscillations at the cost of settling time. So what I mean by that is, let's go ahead and let's make this even slower again. Zero point, how about 0 0.01? So now it's a really slow pre-filter, okay? So, if we do that, and run this again, aha, look at this, basically no oscillations here, but look at this, it's just so sluggish and so slow, I mean, it's not, it's not anywhere near getting to that one meter even after 60 seconds of simulation. We would have to crank this simulation time up to, I don't know, let's make it, I don't know, 300 seconds and see if that works. Run this again. Okay, now, <laughs> right, now it looks like the system is going to settle. So, as you can see, we, 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 we gain performance in the sense of reducing the overshoot, but it, as, you, as we kind of expect, we, the price we pay for that is the bandwidth of the system and, uh, and, and the settling time. So, um, a pre-filter will, will definitely work, but uh, again, you got to be uh, a little careful about how you choose its parameters. All right, so let's move on to now this second idea of how to fix integrator windup. So this is interesting. Um, you remember our previous discussion where we showed that, uh, you know, the whole idea, what, what the integrator usually does for you is it cleans up steady state error, right? It doesn't allow that steady state error to persist. So actually, that's, that's probably why you want to use a PID controller. You want that I to get rid of the steady state error. During the uh, transient phase where you're starting from your set point and getting towards, or sorry, where, where you're starting at your initial condition and getting towards your set point, usually it's the proportional and the derivative control that are doing a lot of the work. And then it's steady state that work and needs to be transitioned over to the integrator component, right? So one idea is actually, uh, heck, why, just turn the integrator off. Don't even use the integrator until you get near the set point. So I kept this picture up uh, with our pre-filter because I think this is, you know, we can use it for this discussion. So what we're basically saying is, okay, if this red signal or heck, even the or the black signal, if, if one of these is your reference, and again, the blue is what your actual system is doing, maybe what you want to do is just come up with some band right here and here right and you only turn on integrator in this band
right? So what that's going to do is the integrator, if you only turn it on when the, the, when the blue line or when the output or the response to your system enters this band, what it's going to do is it's, you won't integrate all of this other error down here, right? Right? So then you again, you, re you reduce the amount of error that that integrator can accumulate, right? And what it will do is it will go ahead and still not let steady state error persist as long as the system is within this band. Because once you're in this band, then sure, it acts like a normal PID controller. But otherwise, when you're outside, it just acts as a PD controller and doesn't integrate all of this error, okay? Now, the only thing, uh, again, to maybe mention right now is solutions two, you know, three and four, we're gonna see in just a second, but but definitely solution two. This this logic that we're just talking about here, you can almost think about this. This is like an there, there's like an if statement you have to put somewhere in your diagram here. Like if this output is in a certain range, then behave a certain way, otherwise do something else. So what I'm trying to get at there is the second you try to do something like item number two, you've turned this now into a non-linear system. So while this might work and it makes a lot of uh, intuitive sense the only thing that we have to worry about now is suddenly there's no th there's no idea of poles or linear systems any longer we've now made this a non-linear hybrid switch system and uh, a, a lot of bets on stability and performance are out the window okay so um, yeah, that's the idea with number two. Not, not not much to it, so I don't think we need to kind of beat it to the ground because it's a it's a really simple idea. Um, a perhaps a slightly more complicated idea is number three. So tell you what, let's pause the camera, give me a second to erase a little bit of this board, and uh, let's talk about number three. All right, so the idea with solution three is uh, is similar to solution two, except it's a, it's a little bit more elegant um, in the sense that we can modify this control law instead of integrating from time zero all the way to the current time what we can do is why don't we only integrate over a finite look back window so what i mean by that is like i said instead of integrating from time zero maybe integrate from time t minus w where w is like the number of seconds uh in the past you want to pay attention to so what that looks like in a picture is again let's look at the, the response or the command the response the error and the integrator signal. This is similar to what we looked at earlier. And again, let's go with our, our, our step input. So again, your reference is here, and then we're going to jump up to some command like that. And what we are going to expect to happen, right, is the error is initially zero, right? And then uh, the system is going to start responding, right? It's going to do something. I don't know. Let's, let's, let's go like this, right? Maybe, uh, and we'll stop at this point because I think that will illustrate what we're trying to show. Okay. So what happens here to the air is this thing jumps up and then it starts coming down like that. Okay. So now what we're doing is we're considering the time T here. Okay. How do I con compute the, uh, the, the control signal. Okay, so again, let's let's maybe assume ki is equal to one just to make our life uh, a little bit easier for the purpose of this picture. So now, this is again the time t. What we are going to do now is you're going to look back a time w seconds in the past. So maybe let's say uh, you know something like this. Okay, so this distance here is w seconds right so this time here is t minus w right so now what you're doing is instead of integrating right the way the integrator used to do it is it would integrate all of this error under this curve to get the control output at this current time t now what we're doing is we're only integrating over this region right only for the past t seconds. So what that's going to do for your integrator signal is, you know, it's going to start zero, okay? And then it's going to grow like it used to, okay? But once you get past w seconds, it's going to start changing its behavior from a from a standard PID controller and it will probably do something like actually if you look at this, it's probably going to do something like this. Right? Because this look back window is is the amount of error uh, area under the error <laughs> curve is getting smaller and smaller as you kind of move forward, okay? So this is also another way that you can sort of limit the amount of uh, error that the uh, integrator is allowed to accumulate, 
right? Uh, yeah, so there we go. And, and really, uh, again, this is, a, this is a nice idea, and it's, uh, it, it comes from the idea or the general concept of we don't want to let the integrator blindly accumulate or wind up all of this area under the error curve, right? So that actually leads to number four, okay? So let's talk about that next. Okay, so number four is maybe the culmination of this, this idea of, you know, two and three kind of uh, set the stage and got us thinking about, at the end of the day, really what we're talking about is, is, is number four is maybe perhaps the most elegant way to deal with this problem. And what that is, is we basically just want to limit uh, the amount of error or the state of this integrator. We want to limit it to some maximum and some minimum value. So what we mean by that is this state xi, the state of the integrator versus time, right? In the past, we saw, like, for example, with that Arison example, uh, you know, this, this had the potential to wind up and keep going on its way off to positive infinity, and now you're in big trouble, right? So one idea is it's really simple. Just cap this. Say you have some xi max. And if the integrator tries to keep integrating past that, you're going to say, nope. The integrator, I want you to just stop and hold your state at this upper line. And similarly, you might have a negative line, and that negative line doesn't even have to be the same value, right? Maybe it's, it's a lot closer, right? So here is your x integrator min, the state of it, right? So again, if for whatever reason the, the system starts coming back and tries to go lower, nope, you're just gonna hold it flat at this region. So all you're doing is you're clamping down the region Ah, all right. So you still integrate from time zero. Maybe let's change this back, right? Let's change this back to, to the original control law. Except this integral, this term right here, you are only going to allow it to stay at a certain value. Okay, so the state of the integrator is going to be capped at an upper and lower limit. And again, I'm stressing that word. It's the state. It's not the output. I'm not limiting this signal. I mean, we are by limiting the state of it, but um, we're not saturating the signal. And, and again, sorry, maybe, maybe that'll become clear in just two seconds when we, well, I'll show you an explicit example of that. But I do want to, to make sure we're, we're on the same page here, right? We're, we're limiting the amount of error that the integrator is allowed to accumulate, right? So we're holding its state at an upper and lower limit, right? And what's really nice about this concept is MATLAB actually has a, uh, a way to do that. So let's jump over to Simulink and we'll show that you can actually easily modify this integrator block in Simulink to have this behavior of an upper and lower uh, limit. All right, let me show you how easy it is to add that limiting feature in the integrator. So again, let's just grab an integrator and drop it into our model. Let me turn the name on just so you can see uh, one of the changes in a second. And now to add that integrating uh, limiting feature, just double click on the block. And notice here there is this uh, option here to limit the output. So if you click the check mark on that, you see it gives you an upper and lower saturation limit. And this is literally those lines we drew on the board. So if I want to say I want to limit the state of the integrator to be like plus 10 and uh, minus 2, you go ahead and do this and hit apply. And look, it draws it as a slightly different um, integrator. Now, what this integrator is doing is it will now stop at those limits that we just spoke about. Right. So again, it's really simple. Now, while we're sitting here at this, I do want to uh, make one comment. Um, I really think it's unfortunate that for whatever reason, reason MathWorks decided to call this this limit output. Uh, I think they should have called it limit state is maybe a better name for this because what you're actually doing is behind the hood is it is limiting the state of the integrator, which does actually limit the output, but it's it's a very slightly nuanced discussion that we need to have here in terms of, of how you want to, to change the, uh, how we're talking about this. What I mean by that is let me show you a Simulink model where there might be some confusion. So uh, here. 
So this is exactly what we just discussed, okay? So here's this limited integrator where I have the limited output checked and I have an upper and lower integration limit. I think in my simulation I have positive four and, and minus four. That's what, I, that's what I put into here, okay? Now, be, uh, sorry, I, I closed that prematurely. I, I wanted to stare at this limit output uh, nomenclature, the way they decided to label it, right? Um, you might think that, oh, if all I have to do is limit the output, maybe all I have to do is something like this up top, right? So you see right up here is I have an integrator which is not limited, but I am limiting its output, right? That's what this saturation block does. The problem is these two systems, the upper and bottom one, are not the same. You want this bottom system because this top system... If you think about this long enough, it this integrator is still subject to wind up, right? It can wind up as much error as it wants, and all we're doing is saturating the output so that the output here stays between a positive and a, uh, a, a, an upper and a lower limit, right? So long story short, even if you feed in the same error signal to both the top and the bottom, they don't produce the same output. In fact, let me run this for you, and I'll show you that here. Look at this. This clearly shows that these two systems behave differently. The blue one is the saturate, uh, the, the the one you want, and the the yellow one is that top s uh, system which we just limit the output, but we don't limit the integrator state. So again, um, I I I know I'm kind of being nitpicky about this, but I really don't like the name which says limit output. I really think they should have said limit state. Um, which would make this a lot more clear. Um, while we're talking about kind of slight nuanced differences, uh, maybe the other thing to think about now is, again, when you add this, this limiting in your integrator, you now make this a nonlinear system, and a lot of the tools and the rules that we've developed for linear systems kind of go out the door when you start playing with these, these nonlinear blocks. So for example, let me show you another model, which is very, very similar, okay? Now this, let me, let me minimize that, I'll bring this one up, okay? So here we go, all this is, doesn't this look like your your integrator part of the PID controller, right? You feed it an error, we do some integration, we multiply by a gain KI, and we get the, the component of control due to the integrator, right? That makes sense. Down here, this bottom system, it's the exact same system, but the order is reversed, right? In this case, the gain comes before the limited integrator. Right now, if we didn't have these limits on this, if these were both pure integrators, it doesn't matter if the gain comes before or after the integrator. Right? They're they're exactly the same. Right? Um, however, now that we have a nonlinear block, th these two systems are not the same. Right? The top and the bottom are going to behave differently. So let me just show you this. This top integrator, it has that same upper and lower limit that this bottom integrator has, right? These two integrators are the same, but just by the virtue of, does the gain come before or after the integrator? If I run this model again with the exact same input going to both of them, these two do not behave the same, right? You can see that they, they, they're clearly different. So again, slightly insidious thing that you might want to think about if you're very used to playing with linear systems where the order of blocks and series don't matter the second you do something nonlinear like this well guess what they, they 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 start to matter right um and again while we're talking uh side notes maybe i will mention um my preference is to sort of do this bottom uh, architecture where I have the gain come first and then the integrator and the reason I like that is because now when I am placing these upper and lower saturation limits on the integrator this is literally the upper amount of control authority that I'm granting the integrator in terms of computing the control signal right and similarly for the lower limit right so these upper and lower limits are literally the maximum and minimum values that come out of here which are then gonna probably be combined with your proportional and derivative control to make your overall control signal. So this has units of whatever your control signal has. So it helps me understand a little bit better of what is a reasonable upper and what is a reasonable lower limit of this integrator. Okay, so 
Uh, I think this makes sense in, uh, you know, in a, in a vacuum, right? Hopefully that is, is reasonable. Let's go ahead and see if we can fix, for example, like that Aerosond uh, crash problem. If we can just add this, this uh, integrator limited state and uh, fix this windup issue. All right, here we are back at our uh, vehicle following the waypoint guidance example. And uh, what we want to do now is let's limit this moment controller integrator state so it's not able to wind up all that error. So I'm going to come in here again, click on limit output. And uh, yeah, I guess I already had this set up to some values. Let, let's go ahead and make it 0.05 and minus 0 0.05. Okay, so now... We've got this thing limited. So again, that is literally the amount of control that we are going to allow this integrator to exert on the overall system. So now let's go ahead and rerun this simulation and see how this does. So again, uh, here we are in this racetrack pattern where it's now, instead of accumulating tons and tons of error, it's probably hit that cap and limited it itself. So when it switches over right about... Now, there we go. Look at that. Last time, it spiraled out of control and completely crashed and totally failed. And now, look at that. It switched over, and it's now merrily and happily on its way um, across the Atlantic uh, for our mission. So, there you go. This seems like it works great in this situation. All right, so that worked. Um, I want to leave it with a couple of uh, departing comments about these solutions two through three, right? So we saw that the idea with these two through three uh, approaches were basically trying to limit the amount of uh, error that the integrator was allowed to accumulate. So a lot of times you'll see these approaches referred to as integrator uh, anti-windup schemes anti wind up techniques or schemes right because that's what you're doing you're trying to not allow the integrator to wind up too much um okay so with that being said i think that's a good discussion on how to deal with the integrator components in this i portion of the PID controller. So we saw that basically one of the most effective ways to do that is to turn this from a normal integrator, right, into an integrator that implements anti one of these anti windup schemes and MATLAB natively handles solution number four pretty easily. You can obviously write your own code if you want to implement number two or number three uh, as an anti windup scheme, maybe even stack that all on top of, of uh, these other, of, of item number four, okay? Now, <laughs> This is pretty interesting because now if you think about this, if you look at this controller, uh, again, now it's no longer, it's not a simple P i d any longer right so over the course of the last few hours we've discussed we changed this d this is now like a d star right because we now got the pseudo derivative and now this is almost also like an i star <laughs> uh system right and then to make this even more complicated you can even add this pre-filter outside of the pid to kind of deal with a lot of these issues so as you saw uh, the pid controller it's a very popular very uh, uh, simple idea, but there are a lot of potential pitfalls if you want to go about implementing these, and I hope that we've covered some of these today. Um, one thing I do want to mention, with all of this discussion, right, uh, I think it is important that we delineate which of these allow us to stay in the linear realm and which of these solutions uh, jump us and bump us over into this nonlinear realm where uh, a lot of these analysis tools are not uh, applicable any longer. So uh, the things that are allowed for linear analysis, right? Let's talk about this. So this pseudo derivative is totally fine, right? The pseudo derivative is still linear, right? Because you look at this thing, it's uh, it's a, it's basically a like we said, it's a integrator or a differentiator followed by a low pass filter. It's basically a linear transfer function. So you introduce a pseudo derivative, you don't break linearity, right? There are still poles associated with the entire system uh, and we're all still fine. Um, what else? This pre-filter, right? The pre-filter is, is also fine, right? You add a pre-filter, as long as it's a linear pre-filter, we're, we're still great, okay? Now, the problem is a lot of these integrator things that we talked about basically turn us into a non-linear system, right? So basically the integrator uh, 
solutions uh, two, three, or four, right? The second you do any of that, so the picture that we drew here, this is a nonlinear system. This P, I star, D star controller, that's nonlinear. You can't talk about poles or stability of the system. Well, I guess you can always talk about stability, but there's no such thing as poles or zeros. Um, you have this now switch system where it's a little bit uh, a little bit dicey, right? So um, again, it's, it's just something I think you need to be aware of if you're actually going about and thinking about implementing this type of a system. So uh, there you have it. I think with that being said, this is probably a great spot to leave it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. And if so, I also hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to recognize and thank some of our new patrons uh, who are supporting the channel. Again, uh, I'll flash some of their names up here. We really appreciate the support. And if you like the video, I hope you'll also join them and head over to the Patreon page and maybe consider supporting the channel as well as it's gonna allow me to continue making these videos in the future future. And remember, speaking of the new videos, those come out every single Monday. So I hope I'll be able to catch you at one of these and we can all learn something new together. So until then, uh, I think this now is probably a good spot to sign off. Talk to you later. Bye.